uh, today. We have um, a wonderful opportunity today to hear an oral history of the progression of, or the, let me say the creation and progression of community medicine, not only in the United States, um, which began here at the University of Kentucky, but also how community medicine had then transformed and um, evolved, we'll say into um, our, our, our home college of public health. So we have uh, two phenomenal uh, individuals today that are going to share this uh, oral history with us. We have Dr. Uh, Douglas Scutchfield, who is the founding Dean of the College of Public Health. He is, um, he was also, before establishing our College of Public Health, he was the founding Dean of the San Diego State University School of Public Health. Um, and right now he is currently the Peter P. Botham Professor Emeritus. Um, he has been a consultant and a public health international leader uh, for, for decades um, with government organizations in, in Panama, China, Saudi Arabia, Israel. Um, his uh, renowned and uh, ability to create programs and see the value and potential and the vision for the future is um, clearly, clearly evident. Um, he's right also currently the editor-in-chief of a journal that he founded, um, which is the Journal of Appalachian Health. So welcome, Dr. Scutchfield. We also have with us um, an, uh, another amazing colleague. Um, UK is just, I would say, richly blessed with uh, the, you know, the strength and, and fortitude of our, um, our founding fathers. Um, we have Dr. Samuel Matheny. He earned his MD um, here at the University of Kentucky in the College of Medicine. Um, he also has worked all over the United States. Um, he is the past president of the Association of Departments of Family Medicine um, and the Kentucky Academy of Family Physicians. Um, he formerly was the Associate Provost for Global Health here at UK. And from 1993 to 2011, he was the Department Chair of Family and Community Medicine. So we, we are delighted to be able to hear this conversation um, today between these uh, two illustrious gentlemen. Um, so we, we look forward to hearing the history. So without further ado, I will begin sharing the, the slides that we've prepared. My mistake, they kind of closed out there for a moment when I uh, clicked off, but we're gonna open it right back up. Well, while Aaron is doing that, I'll just, just chime in and just talk a little bit about why that we decided to do this. And part of it is because that, um, you know, it's, it's, it's one thing to know about history, but it's another thing just to say, okay, what's the value of the history and what, what did we learn at UK and what lessons can we take away and why should we care about this history at all at this point? What's relevant? Uh, and with Aaron being the Dushal chair, being named the Dushal chair, it gave us an opportunity to really reflect on this and just sort of see where we have been, where we are going, and what's the significance at UK. And just to, for those uh, who is, are not nearly as old as the ancient ones who are doing this presentation, UK was a pretty formidable place to be a medical student and really an exciting place because it was one of the first medical schools created after the Second World War. There was a lot of innovation and a lot of challenges in American medicine at that point. And UK was very fortunate to have some incredible leadership, which we will go into in a little bit more detail. And Scutch had a lot more personal connection with that. He is the, he is the, the leader and the researcher and the, uh, and the uh, expert in public health in many different capacities. My interest was more in education and in, in public health service as well as being uh, in family medicine. So uh, he has, I, I'm going to uh, acquiesce to his calls and his judgment on the opinions on many of this that we're going to be talking about, but I hope that we can stay in a logical fashion on this. We're both it cites away from the College of Public Health. And so it's a challenge for us. And we have a long history of talking and discussing with each other. So this will be a discussion between the two of us. And 
we'll probably interrupt and repeat ourselves a number of times. So please bear with us. And Aaron is going to try to keep us on track. But um, this, I, I will go back and later and tell you about this picture because at the end of the lecture, this one picture summarizes exactly where one of the things that Kurt did to take this department in a very interesting direction and where it continues to go in this direction in the future. Awesome. Great. So this was the title that you had outlined. And we'll begin. The, uh, we really began, uh, this is Scott, Dr. Scott, we really began the discussion, I think, with the creation of the University of Kentucky Medical Center uh, and the founding father of that particular institution, of the institution we serve, uh, Dr. William Willard. And I think we have a picture uh, on the slides of Bill Willard. Dr. Willard was an unusual- uh, next, next picture. Yeah. Yeah, do you see, I have him on, William? No, it's uh, still the history of preventive medicine. Oh, on my screen it has uh, William. But uh, Bill Willard was an unusual medical school dean. A lot of people don't realize uh, that Bill Willard had an interesting history that prompted him to take a different perspective when he developed uh, the College of Medicine and the uh, Medical Center itself. Um, he was a, uh, in addition to his MD from Yale, he also held a DRPH from Yale. Uh, a doctorate in public health. And that while he had trained formally at Johns Hopkins after he'd gotten his MD degree at Yale as a pediatrician, uh, Bill didn't practice much pediatrics. He ended up mostly in administrative and, and, uh, and preventive medicine. And in point of fact, uh, he had the vision, oh, he, he served as the health officer for the state of Maryland. Uh, shortly after he finished his pediatric training at, at Johns Hopkins. He also was responsible for the preventive medicine program uh, following the armistice in, uh, in Korea. And so had a, a tremendous experience with public health from that particular perspective. He was on the faculty of the Department of Epidemiology and Preventive Medicine at Yale University, which was a part of the College of Medicine. And um, that's now the Yale School of Public Health, which spun out of that College of Medicine. But he had been the, the responsibility for continuing education for the entire medical school, medical center, as one was in epidemiology. He then founded the medical school, didn't found the medical school at Syracuse, but Syracuse had a private medical school. Bill was responsible for bringing that private medical school into SUNY, the State University of New York, which is the overall state organization for administration of higher education in, in New York. Bill uh, brought that private institution into a state supported institution. He uh, came here in the mid 50s uh, and he brought a different approach to. Uh, medicine and education of medicine. He, he, he recognized the importance of behavior and human behavior and its relevance to those of us who care for patients and how to deal with them. So he, he established the first Department of Behavioral Sciences in a medical school uh, in the United States. And from that department, headed by Bob Strauss, it was created the Association of Bi Behavioral Sciences and Medical Education. An organization that still thrives today, which has to do with trying to provide to medical students uh, how they might best function in dealing with health and human behavior. He also obviously was the first uh, or established the notion of, of a department of community medicine and brought, uh, brought Kurt Duschel on board to, to chair that, a point I'll come to again later. He also appointed a very unusual chairman of internal medicine, Dr. Ed Pellegrino, a very, very distinguished physician, actually had never held a faculty appointment. He had worked at Hunterdon, New Jersey Medical Center, 
which was trying innovative mechanisms of provision of medical care. And uh, he was named without ever having uh, formally been an academic position as the professor and chair of the Department of Internal Medicine at the University of Kentucky, went on to a variety of other additional uh, seats and roles that he had, ranging from uh, the president of Catholic University to the uh, 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 responsibility at Georgetown for the creation of a center for uh, 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 bioethics and, and philosophy of medicine. These individuals- I'd, I'd, I'd say he was, he was probably the, the I would say the founder of medical ethics as well. I mean, he was the editor of one of the first journals and, and I mean, most people considering him probably one of the greatest uh, physicians of the 20th century. Yeah, I don't think there's any question about that. And remember that there were, at that point in time, the Sam and I were here, we were in a lot of uh, residence between us and the chairman. And I, you know, all of us had the opportunity to interact with Dr. Colville on an ongoing basis. But again, Bill Wood recognized the capacity. Bill built the physical plant that was the hospital and the medical school and the dental school, which had all been approved. Um, the School of Nursing had also been approved, and, and uh, it was also brought on board by, by Bill. But Bill's big, I think, an important role uh, in our conversation today was that he was a public health physician. He recognized the importance of it. He had read, as had Kurt McGavern, a, a article by Edna Brett McGavern, who was the uh, Dean of the School of Public Health in North Carolina, who talked about treating the community as you would the patient in terms of history, physical, same things you do with a patient, if you're a physician, you can do with a community. And so the notion of community diagnosis and community medicine came from that. And that's what one of the major strands uh, that Kurt, Dr. Duchel picked up in his uh, relationship uh, with that particular uh, activity. Uh, Kurt came as the first chair of the Department of Community Medicine. No, back uh, one, that's it. Kurt uh, worked at the time he was called by uh, Bill Willard uh, to come here to the University of Kentucky at the Mini Farms uh, project, which was an Indian Health Service project designed to control or to eradicate tuberculosis. Uh, Kurt probably, well, he was. He, he was uh, influenced heavily by Walsh McDermott at Cornell. Cornell had a TB uh, control grant to work in Mini Farms in the Navajo Nation. Uh, to try to control tuberculosis in that particular group. Uh, his, Kurt's exposure to that was led to a lot of uh, uh, things that uh, were important to, uh, I think, the development of, of community medicine. One of the classic stories about Kurt was he was discovered that a lot of the TB patients never came to the Indian Health Service Hospital. They were going to the Kieran Darrow, uh, the local uh, medicine man. And, uh, so he met with him and he said, tell you what, we'll work out a deal. I'll get you to consult on all of the patients that come to me uh, with tuberculosis. And you get me to consult with you on all the patients you get who come to you with tuberculosis. And between the two of us, we'll be able to cure these individuals. So the notion of bringing this, uh, a health personnel is one of, one of Kurt's strengths as a part of, of that particular activity. Uh, Kurt set up uh, two, actually three rotations uh, for the medical uh, students. And, Scutch, uh, could I could I interrupt just one second? Please. Could we go to the next slide? Just wanted to uh, talk about a, this period that Kurt was in many farms. Uh, let's go to the, just down one slide. Uh, he partnered, no, one back up. He partnered with also John Adair, and this became one of the great classics in American medical literature at that point, which is called The People's Health. And it was really one of the first times that, as, as Scutch mentioned, that the whole concept of bringing a medical anthropologist into the aspects of, of medicine and working together in a team, as, Kurt, as Scutch talked about. So this book became one of the great classics that uh, was taught in medical schools and referred to for many years thereafter. Uh, it's, 
it was republished in 1970 uh, or 1980, I think, as a second edition. But the concept and the notion of, of multidisciplinary activity. The other thing that happened at this point and that Kirk and John Dare talk about in this book is the fact, as, as Scutch mentioned, that they used uh, people who had been ill in the hospital and in the system and asked them to help them go back in the communities and help them work with their patients. And this was probably the first example of using community health workers and training those people. And then he does a lot of discussion, some very humorous things in the book about how that that worked and trying to get translations and communications with a language that they didn't know how to speak and it was a very difficult language to learn. But the idea of community health workers probably began in the United States with this movement that Kurt had. So it's like other things that we'll talk about later. The, some of these concepts that seem to be pretty standard now all came out of these early years here. At, or many of them came out of the early years at community medicine and, and with both uh, the leadership of uh, internal medicine and, and community medicine and, and behavioral science. Yeah, Sam, you might, while, you, while you're talking, you might want to talk a little bit about the program of education for us medical students that Kurt set up in the College of Medicine, the kind of how the uh, education flowed from, the, uh, from our second year uh, community medicine course to the rotation in the community, and then in the case of electives in our senior year, rotation to international health, uh, international activity. Why don't you pick that up and kind of run a little bit, Sam? Okay. Well, actually, let me go back one more to the slide before this, where it Kirk's picture, because I want to play a little clip of it. There is a um, there is a, a thing in the library called the Louis Nunn Oral History uh, Center, and uh, it it has uh, Rick Smoot, who is a professor at BCTC, a professor of history recorded a number of these leaders. And one of them is a recording of Kurt Dussel, which I think is one of the more fascinating. Unfortunately, Kurt had a speech problem by the time that this was made. And this is a fairly, his voice was quite mild, but I wanted just to have you have a chance to hear his voice and hear what he said, particularly about how the name community medicine came about. It, it really started with his concept and his thought of what was going on in many farms. It was his invention, but let him, tell you in his words how he decided because he got some ideas when he came here about other things that he might call it and then why he went back and decided on community medicine so at that point let's just play a sh very short video of uh audio of, of kurt great thank you and if uh if you hear it okay you can give me a thumbs up i'm gonna give this a try so when dr willard appeared at my door one day uh and asked me if I were interested in setting up a program. He said, you can call it what you want, as long as it deals with populations. And he was, as you know, a public health physician originally. And so after many discussions and a couple of visits to Lexington, I left Cornell New York Hospital, where I was an assistant professor, and went down as professor of community medicine uh, in Lexington. I wasn't sure about the name community medicine, but uh, because departments were called public health departments, they were called preventive medicine departments, uh, environmental health departments, uh, and talking to some of the doctors, uh, they said, don't call it the Department of Public Health because that makes it seem like it's a uh, uh, really a part of the health department, and that group isn't particularly popular with them practicing physicians. Why was that? Because they saw it as an administrative thing where the state puts restraints on doctors and monitors them and so on. And uh, so I said, well, what about social medicine? And they said, oh, no, never use that. They'll think it's communism. They'll think it's uh, uh, socialized medicine. So you don't dare use that. And then I said, well, what about preventive medicine? And my colleagues, including Dr. Pellegrino, said, well, we do prevention in our clinical work. I mean, the OBGYN, we're always doing pap smears and checking for breast lumps and so on. And, uh, and uh, pediatrics is almost all preventive medicine. So what, you know, what are you selling? So 
I thought, well, population medicine might be uh, a useful term. But then I thought of that as something with family planning. Uh, and environmental medicine or environmental health seemed to be just a piece of total public health. So I said, well, then I'll stick to what I thought I would like to call it, which is community medicine. And, and then I defined it in, a, in one sentence, which I said a little earlier, and that is, it's that discipline in medicine that deals with the identification and solution of health problems in population groups, period. Uh, in the past, departments had definitions that filled an entire page. And uh, I thought if you can't define it in one sentence, there's got to be something wrong with your thinking. So the first department of community medicine was the one in Kentucky by that name. And since then, it's spread around, and although it's still a mixture in this country. But in England, it's interesting. They changed their uh, from public health to community medicine. And it's, it's stuck there very clearly. That's fine, Aaron. That's awesome. So in, in light of that, uh, a couple of things that were really interesting to me in looking back and remembering and uh, what was going on is, is that Kurt had several ideas. And one of them is, is that, you know, this is a new concept and medical students haven't changed a whole lot. They, what they really want to do is learn about medicine and anything that's not directly related to what they think is going to help them either on an exam or working with the patient gets sort of third or fourth birth, uh, level of interest to them. So when he introduced community medicine in his second year and Scott to chime in, you know, it was based on a lot of several seminars. They were really thought through very carefully, but they all helped had to do with clinical case studies. And so we were taught community medicine, we were taught biostatistics and epidemiology, but it was taught through these seminars. And the seminars were, were, were rigorous, but they were really interesting because he had superb teachers. And there were 72 hours of instruction in the second year of medical school at that point on epidemiology and biostatistics through this. So then students who came into their fourth year, which was when the required clerkship occurred, were all prepared and they were expected at that point. And this was another innovation that to my knowledge, this was the first time it had occurred in the United States was that he said, we've got to get these students out into the community because if they're going to really serve Kentucky, then they're going to have to know what Kentucky is all about. And many of them were Kentuckians, but in the sixties, very few of medical students had ever left Kentucky. And it really, even in Kentucky, their knowledge about if they were from Louisville or Lexington, their knowledge about rural Kentucky, uh, particularly in the mountains, was sometimes limited. So the, he decided to partner with practicing physicians. And so he and, he and Kirk talks about this. He said it was not a preceptorship. And the term he used as preceptorship was somebody who just walked around following a physician in their practice. These had to be people who were actually seeing patients, presenting those patients, and making sure that they were clinically competent. And he did the same thing with his faculty. In fact, with his faculty, he said, and he had a joke with Ed Pellegrino, he said, you know, all my faculty need to take time on the clinical services and be clinically active as Ed Pellegrino always did himself. And said, you know, so I'm depending on you to work with our, our in-house training of our faculty. So Ed Pellegrino always used to say, he said, well, Kurt is in charge of the in-house and uh, cor uh, correction, he said, Ed is in charge, I'm in charge of the in-house and Kirk's in charge of the outhouse. So that was his way of defining the differences, but they were extremely good friends. They were, they had offices next door to each other and they com continually communicated as they did also with Nick Pizzicano that I'll talk about in a minute. But so the fourth year then was a required clerkship in the community, as I said, probably the first time that it occurred, and now it's a standard throughout all medical schools in the country, particularly in family medicine and also in peds and internal medicine. All students had to do an original research project on that six-week rotation, and they also had to do something that 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 uh, Scutch talked about, which was called a community diagnosis, and he talked about the dean at, at, uh, at Duke uh, introducing that term, but Kirk refined it and the students had to do a written report that then was based on their their studies during that time 
I was in talking and, and students did very creative research. Uh, I, the, the former dean of the College of Medicine, Emory Wilson, said that when he went out with Kurt on this rotation, he did a study at that time on, stu on patients' perceptions of what physicians were telling them in their practice. And he got his random study by going to the Kentucky Utilities Office and picking every 25th name on the list and then going and interviewing them. And then he wrote, and he said, and he is a very distinguished physician, but and he's written hundreds of papers. His first published paper was a community medicine paper that he did in Kirk's work in that rotation in community medicine. He also was impressed because Kirk took him on an airplane trip at that point to Owen County, which is where he was in practice. And he, <clears throat> during that trip, Kirk got up and he said, look where you are in Owen County. He said, there's over there, you can see Cincinnati and you can see Louisville and here is Lexington. And we're in a triangle with all those three. And he said, what if, Owen County, and it was not that rich at that point, he says, what if they really focused on doing, uh, doing truck farming and, and serving uh, those three communities with foods that they grow locally? How would that do to increase? And, you know, 60 years ahead of his time and thinking through those ideas, but he was thinking not just about medicine, but about what those communities could do and how they could be served. So that was really what the community medicine rotation was about. And then following that, I'll come back to in a little bit, talk about how that developed and went into the, to the global, the international programs that were also the first in the United States. Yeah, as Sam suggested, uh, the three things we had, or the two, well, two or three things we had to do when we were in the community. First thing was a community diagnosis. I was sent to Lawrence, uh, Lawrenceburg out in Anderson County and with a physician, family physician there. And uh, I did my uh, field work doing the community diagnosis, worked closely with the public health nurses uh, who were, who blew me away. I just couldn't believe individuals were that engaged uh, with their communities and other mm -hmm. communities as well as the public health nurses when we go out around the boondocks with them. But did the community diagnosis in my particular situation? I also, my, my physician uh, colleague, uh, place, whatever, uh, did he was a family doctor, did OB. And he and I talked, and I told I, I was interested in the time in OBGYN. And uh, he said, Well, why don't you go ahead and see what's going on in my practice? And so what I did was basically a practice audit of his obstetrical patients and activities. I also did a intestinal parasite uh, uh, epidemiology study in the in the children of uh, of Anderson County. Uh, I didn't publish those, but uh, later on, when I had students, I had one wonderful student named David uh, Richardson, uh, who was from Moorhead, and I was in Moorhead as a field professor at the time, and he and I. He'd been reticent to go out on the community medicine rotation that we had. Uh, but I sat and told him that, you know, if you look, if you're interested in an academic career in, in surgery, which he was, so we can get two or three papers out of your experience uh, in, in, with me in Moorhead. And we sure enough did. We published uh, three, at least three papers out of that experience uh, that he did. So those were the kinds of things that, that you would, would expected to do when we were out in the community. There's some other good stories too. The, one of my favorites is the, uh, the situation where uh, we were all given to take cars that we could use while we were on our clerkship. And one of the state cars, of course, the state cars, you know, had a big sign on the side of them that, that, that they belonged to the Commonwealth of Kentucky. And uh, at least one situation occurred in the mountains when uh, when they, there was a shotgun that was actually fired at one of the uh, uh, one of the state cars because of the kind of reticence of having any uh, folks who might appear to be revenue like back in the hills of Kentucky. Uh, so a great story that, that occurred there. Uh, another thing, well, I came back uh, after uh, after my training uh, to UK and worked in Moorhead. And uh, I worked with the students who came out on uh, clerkships in Moorhead. 
and in the surrounding areas in the, in the northeastern part of, uh, of Kentucky. And I was what was called a field professor of community medicine. One of the things that happened early on as the Department of Community Medicine was Walter Trover, who was kind of a visionary physician in Madisonville and was building uh, a major medical center there in, in, in Madisonville, felt like he needed somebody who could look at the community more broadly. And he went about the process of hiring a, a physician, a young physician from the University of North Carolina named Dave Mar Dan Martin. And Dan said, I'll come, but I want to have an academic relationship, which uh, Loman Trover was tickled to death with. So what they did is they went to Kurt again and created the notion of the field professor of community medicine, uh, where there were people actually out in the Commonwealth of Kentucky, basically very similar in idea to the cooperative extension agents that worked with the College of Agriculture. Again, they played to our land grant institution's interest. And uh, both myself and, and uh, Bill Keck, who I've written a couple of texts with, who past president of the American Public Health Association, why not? It was in Hazard, I was in Moorhead. We had a fellow named Bob Gore down in Somerset, a fellow named Joe Alter, who was over uh, in the Western part of the state, as well as Dan Martin who were uh, basically clinical appointees, clinical faculty, uh, working in their communities in a variety of different ways. Uh, for example, Bill Keck, in addition to his other role uh, with, as a field professor, is also the director of the uh, Upper Kentucky River District Health Department. Um, I was working actually with the hospital in, in, uh, in, in Moorhead, St. Clair Medical Center, uh, to expand and develop the capacity to provide services there. Uh, there was a, a fellow who was in uh, Everett's down in Harlan County uh, who was responsible for building one of the first, well, it probably was the first community health center in the Commonwealth of Kentucky and uh, was a uh, was an instant success at Everett's. Uh, so, you know, those field professors, I think, were again a notion that was, was an outreach from the University Medical Center to the community. Yeah, uh, I would also say that you know that it, it prompted a uh, development of some other kind of notions. Um, for example, the notion of the teaching health department. Now we're talking about the academic health departments now, but the, the real concept went back to uh, a fellow who was the chair of community medicine here at one point in time, who also was the director of the Lexington Fayette County Health Department, who said, well, I'm no different than the chairman of medicine. The chairman of medicine is chair of medicine, but he is also the chief physician in internal medicine for the University of Kentucky Hospital. And what we need to do is create these teaching health departments. I actually wrote a paper about them uh, that presages what was happening now, is happening now with teaching health departments by, by many, many years. Um, the unfortunate thing, obviously, about the, the, the department was it, was it was largely built on and maintained by Kurt's enthusiasm. Kurt could sell shoes to a snake. And whenever we'd come back from our experiences in these rural communities, Kurt would, we had a presentation to make for our community diagnosis and the research we did in the community. And he had the faculty sit on in those seminars and we were all so impressed with the enthusiasm we had for our projects and activities, understanding we had for the Commonwealth. And that enthusiasm and affection and, and his uh, leadership with us prompted us all to love Kurt Dishel. And as a matter of fact, in my particular class, medical school, he was made an honorary member of that class by a vote of the class at the, at when we graduated from medical school uh, because of Kurt's leadership. At that time. Unfortunately, uh, his wife hated Lexington. Uh, she loved New York. Uh, she enjoyed uh, when, when he was there with Cordell Medical School. And so she was hot to get out of Kentucky and, and somehow they persuaded, well, not somehow, but basically to keep his marriage together, I'm told by Bill Willard, he left here and went to Mount Sinai Medical Center 
in New York City, where he picked up instead of rural or the urban interest. But part of the problem then was that his charismatic leadership uh, was in some measures lost. And as a result of that, for whatever reason, one of the deans that subsequently served here at UK Med School decided to abolish the Department of Community Medicine. Uh, the department was abolished uh, lock, stock, and barrel, and those faculty that had uh, tenure were placed in other departments uh, that seemed to be appropriate to their activity. So there was a period of time in the 70s uh, where there was not a department of community medicine at the University of Kentucky because of its abolition. And I've never, I never discussed with, I've never discussed with Dr. Clausen, uh, who's now born, passed, uh, why he did that, but he did it. He got in trouble for it because he had to go through the processes that the university requires, but he did it anyway. <laughs> uh, so, you know, it, it, was, it, was a, it was a tremendous loss, I think, to, to have that uh, happen. But uh, Emory Wilson, who Sam referred to earlier, who became the dean after Dr. Clausen, uh, remember his own personal experiences with community medicine and the importance of community medicine at the University of Kentucky because of its leadership role there. Uh, and as a consequence, he decided to create or recreate uh, a unit that would serve and, and, and a, uh, in that regard within the College of Medicine and created the Department of Preventive Medicine and Environmental Health and brought a individual MD, PhD uh, uh, from uh, Mount Sinai, uh, Art Frank, who set up a new apartment for preventing medicine and environmental health. But before I talk, we talk about that and, and that development, I think, Sam, you need to talk about the international clerkships and how that was kind of a continuation for the sophomore experience and the senior experience and the next experience was obviously the international piece. So you want to visit about that? So. Oh, okay. So this was actually also a first because to my knowledge, there were no international clerkship experience in the country that were tied into a, rig a rigorous study program until Kurt designed this. And he told me once that he had been sitting around on a Saturday afternoon and was thinking about, you know, students here, and as I said, we were all country, country boys and girls and pretty local. And most of us had never, uh, if we'd gone out of the state, it might've been over to, to Jellicoe, Tennessee, but that was about it. And so, but he said, you know, there are things that are going on around the world and there are things that we can learn to bring back into Kentucky. And he early on thought about this being a two way educational process, not us going and doing things to other people, but working with not doing two. And that was always Kurt's philosophy. And so he had relationships that he had done through consultations and also through through people that came to Kentucky to work with him, uh, both from his experience that he had brought with him from uh, the relationships he had with people like Sidney Kark from South Africa and later in Israel, and then other people that came to Kentucky and his, and his residents and fellows. And so he particularly had these in Turkey and in uh, Nigeria and in several parts of South America. And so he, and on that Saturday, uh, wrote grants to a number of foundations in uh, pharmaceutical foundations and got funding to start the first international student program. It became one of the most popular and one of the most sought things and probably one of the things that caused Kentucky's reputation to really uh, to really shine and, and during this international program. And there were somewhere around seven or eight students per year who were selected and they had their expenses paid to do the travel. Not only did the students go, but he also sent a faculty member to go with the students for a period of time. The rotations were longer then, they were three months long for that rotation, but a student was expected to again, do a, a detailed community diagnosis to be a clinician in that community, but also to do an original research paper. This is uh, one of the rotations that occurred in uh, the largest sugar plantation in the world, which is in Bahui, Argentina. Um, the little creek that you see at the side is actually the sewer 
we call it the cloacas, uh, but that's where people both dumped all of their refuse out. And so the, the clinic was right over to the left of where that nurse was. Uh, there were five or six of us at the time who were doing a universal study. Let us go to the next picture. Click the picture if you can. I'm getting there for some okay. reason. Here we go. Okay, so this was where people got their water. This was the runoff from an irrigation canal. Uh, we decided before we left on the advice of uh, Sammy Bosch, who was a later became a, went to Mount Sinai after a revolution occurred in Argentina, that um, there was a real a real problem with with infant mortality rates that had been drastically changing. And we had a suspicion, or they had a suspicion that was related to the, at the introduction of, of uh, bottled, uh, bottled milk for children because of the uh, lack of sanitation of the water supply. This was where these women in Argentina were getting the water to mix, to use in their powdered milk to feed their babies at that point. We discovered an abnormally high infant mortality rate, but so we, studied this in, in Colombia and in Chile and in Argentina, came up with a conjoint study uh, at those, at, through those three areas. And it was, you know, for me, it was a revelation. It was also one of the first times anybody had ever challenged the issue about what Nestle had done and probably in its negativity to uh, decreasing uh, survival of infants in, in South America at that point. So that was, and, the next picture is just the final one of showing you a little bit more about the scenery in that area, but it was a very rugged area. It was right where the, the we call it the Gran Chaco, which is the jungle uh, that goes into Brazil, the Andes and the Pampas all come together. So it was a very poor area. And those people that I showed you in the slide before were Koja Indians who had come from Bolivia. We call them the Cosicheros who came down to cut cane on the large sugar plantation, which was the world's largest. But it was an experience that most of us uh, kept with us the rest of our lives. And Kirk was so concerned that this would be a part of what, that, that, that we needed to have a, a, from the very beginning, both an, an, uh, a look not only in Kentucky, but across the United States, but also around the world, to the point that he had a program set up that was required for all of his faculty to learn Spanish in the first several years of the of the creation of the Department of Community Medicine because he, he figured that medical students and faculty in the future, and this was when there were almost no Spanish speaking people in Kentucky, but that would be the future and that's where we ought to be going. So again, he was a real seer, really understood that. So when I came back in 1993 as the chair, I talked with Dr. Wilson, whom I referred to earlier, and he said, I'd like to start another international committee and let's see what we could do to see if we could regenerate some interest in having the students because it was certainly a big draw for our students and, and, and something that students were becoming very, very interested in in the medical schools and we were trying to respond to those students' need. So with the help of Dr. Wilson, help of David Watt, who got us some funding through a particular scholarship, we were able to start the first international clerkships again uh, and and began those. And uh, then in the last years, after I stepped down as the chair of the department, uh, Dr. Sivaswamy uh, made me assistant provost and we uh, developed these in the College of Medicine and then we're trying to develop similar programs in the College of Pharmacy and the College of Dentistry and Allied Health. And then we developed the program of the shoulder to shoulder where we had students doing rotations in Ecuador, which is still going on today. So all of this really began though with, uh, with our experience, our interest in what we could do in how we could, what we could learn from, but not what we would go and do for, but how we could learn and work with people in different situations. And it was really important because he felt, and Kurt talked about, getting students out of their comfort zone, get them away from where they're familiar and where they're comfortable, put them where they're uncomfortable because that's the only way they can see also what's going on in their own communities when they come home. That's excellent. And this is a picture of you, is that correct, Sam? 
Uh, I don't know who that is. Oh, you don't know? <laughs> I am. I was guess oh, it was I, <laughs> I will tell you a story about that picture, though. That picture represents um, one of the beginning. That's, that's one of the foothills of the Andes. And that mountain, although it has no snow on it, is about, about 16,000 feet high. So we, this is Umawaka, which is right on the Bolivian-Argentinian border. The day was May the 1st, which is Labor Day in South America. And my friend who was with me, who then became a radiologist, went hiking on that mountain. I got tired and came back down. He continued to go up. Uh, we waited that evening. He never came home. So we waited the next day. We figured something's going on. So we sent a search party out. We called the embassy in Washington, Buenos Aires to send helicopters. The helicopters flew in. Finally, about the next day after that, uh, this guy whose name was Ivan Rubel comes wandering down the hill and he's, he's hiding behind cactus because he was sliding down the mountain, which was covered with cactus. He had no clothes on from his waist down because they'd been pulled off by the cactus. And he was covered with cactus spines that we spent the next day pulling out of his rear end. So that was his introduction to community medicine was cactus extrusions from, uh, and he was in bed for the next week trying to recover from, from that. But it was a really wonderful experience for all of us. Except him. Yeah. No, that's me. <laughs> that's great. So th this has been phenomenal um, hearing the history. I would love to hear your perspectives and I'll go back to the beginning um, because I'd like to hear your perspectives. This is the beginning of medicine and now we're in, we have a new department, you know, a college and now a public house. Um, but what do you see as the future? What would you, what do you see as the, the next? Well, I think it's important uh, to talk just briefly about the trans, uh, transmogrification, if you will, of the Department of Community Medicine. As I indicated, uh, after Dr. Clawson had abolished the department, Dr. Wilson wanted to recreate some of the wonder and activity of, of the Department of Community Medicine because of, we were known for that and hired uh, Art Frank, an MD, PhD from Mount Sinai, who had worked with Kurt at Mount Sinai and knew the, uh, and knew the ropes in terms of occupational and environmental health. Art uh, quickly set up a program that involved uh, a number of things. One of the things was that he set up a preventive medicine and an occupational medicine residency program and have residents in both of those particular areas. Interestingly enough, as a part of that, he had to offer an academic year that was the equivalent of an MPH or to offer the MPH. So there was and had been at the University of Kentucky the authority to give a Master's of Science in Public Health uh, that had been there since the 1930s. It had lay, lay fallow and uh, there had been some individuals through that who received their MSPH. My dad, I think, was in the last class that got his M MSPH in 1967, the year after I got my MD degree. And so when we came back, the authority for the granting of that master's degree resided in the Department of Preventive Medicine, Environmental Health. Not only that, some really superlative folks and activities were all going there. Um, I mentioned the two residency programs. Uh, we had a, a fair amount of activity in industrial hygiene. We're actually getting degrees in industrial hygiene. I uh, had toxicology folks that were in that department. I had some crackerjack epidemiologists and a, uh, a center, uh, actually two centers, one that looked at uh, occupational health kind of issues, and another one that, that looked at more preventive medicine related issues. Uh, when I came in 1997 back to the UK, I was given the mandate to try to create a school of public health. One of the things I thought at that point in time, well, first of all, I, I needed an appointment when I came back here, and I had three signees on my appointment letter, and the, the the Dean of Medicine, the Dean of Allied Health, where the Department of Health Service Management resided, 
and uh, and the pre chancellor of the medical center, the chancellor of the medical center was very interested in building a school of public health, a college of public health, which would be uh, we would we would quickly become one of the few uh, places in the nation that had all of the schools of of the health professions uh, in place, uh, and would be a place where, uh, as we brag now. Uh, there are only eight institutions that have both a land grant uh, uh, activity in agriculture and, and ecology, but also uh, public health uh, activities and a college of public health as a result of that. And uh, so we're, we're very unusual in that regard, but uh, we had the authority to grant the degree. And what we very quickly did was work with our Department of Preventive and Environmental Medicine and the Department of Health Services and Management to form the basis for the new College of Public Health. There were other departments and activities that we considered trying to bring into the fold. Those included the Department of Toxicology, uh, at which we talked with, the Department of Behavioral Sciences, which was in the College of Medicine. We had some conversations with the folks at kinesiology and health promotion. Uh, in those three cases, they decided not to join the creation of the School of Public Health, which is fine. Uh, there's, there's no uh, problem associated with that. But the degree was in a Department of Community Medicine. So as a result of that, we were able to, to move forward with the master's degree, which of course, the MPH is the degree you must offer in order for accreditation to occur. And so in some measures, as, uh, as that department moved into medicine or moved into public health, one of the things that happened, I think, was that Sam was anxious uh, appropriately. I have a department or a name that resonated with the notion of some of the work that was being done in the family medicine at that point in time, was centered around the international clerkships that he was running, as well as some of the activities that, uh, that our folks older family community medicine was very interested in. For example, uh, for a long time there, if you were into the academic track within the residency program in family medicine, uh, you were required to get an MPH. So as a consequence, a lot of Sam's departmental faculty uh, who were drawn from those students uh, and residents uh, and fellows uh, were in fact, had MPHs from the UK with us. And uh, I think that that inured to everybody's benefit. Obviously, it gave us a window into medical school and the College of Public Health. Uh, it gave them, them the opportunity to have access to the capacity and, and uh, methodology, both epidemiology and biostatistics, which facilitated the research capacity and important community, the family community medicine, as well as joining uh, some of the notion of individual patient care family uh, care and community care uh, in one, one city. Uh, that authority to grant, our, to grant that particular degree is interesting in that, as most know, when we established the School of Public Health here at UK, the University of Louisville was interested in the same thing and applied for or created a, a, a college, or a School of Public Health there at the University of Louisville. They had anticipated getting accredited, but they they didn't have the authority to offer the MPH degree. That that degree lay with the University of Kentucky, so they had developed MSs and PhDs, academic degrees in those areas. Uh, they discovered, however, that they'd outsmarted themselves because they couldn't get accreditation for a program that offered academic degrees only professional degrees. So our offering of the RPH and the MPH made it very difficult and we were, uh, we again were generous and kind and said, you all want to go ahead and offer the MPH, go ahead, we're not going to fight you at the Council of Post-Secondary Education. So though I must admit that, you know, one of these days I'll tell the story of that founding, but the important thing they recognize here is that we are a continuity from the original Department of Community Medicine at the University of Kentucky Medical Center. Let me just chime in a minute, too, Scotch. Go ahead. So, about uh, the mid 
mid 1990s, then I petitioned the university to rename the department uh, Family and Community Medicine, partly because we wanted to honor Kurt Dussel, but also because we really needed to identify uh, an academic uh, academic part of what uh, it was hard for people to identify that just with family medicine alone. And so we also wanted to do and, and have a focus and a, a center around some academic research in the department. So that's when uh, we recruited, uh, at that point, when after the name change occurred, we recruited Dr. Kevin Pierce to come back and we started the Kentucky Ambulatory Network, which is still going. And that also morphed into a public health network, into a dental network. And then also at that point, uh, there had been a center for uh, excellence in, in um, rural health, which came through some uh, Kentucky legislation and hazard. So that program came into it. And also the whole interest in rural health uh, developed at that point, along with uh, other activities in uh, which had then become called the Office of Rural and Community Health, which for a while was an associate dean's position, but then was uh, that was dissolved several years ago. So there are some new activities. We still have a community. We have now a division of community medicine, and the chair of the department, uh, Dr. Cardarelli, is the also runs the community medicine program in the department. There are research programs and student electives, and then a, a required rotation for medical students for correction for family medicine residents, which is a national requirement for a community medicine activity, which is run by Dr. Hostetti in that particular area. So these activities are continuing in the College of Medicine, but it also is required and, and has benefited from a very close working relationship with the College of Public Health. So. Oh, that was an excellent history. I have if individuals want to unmute themselves at, at this point and um, have any questions um, for our esteemed colleagues. I really appreciate both of you and your role in continuing the legacy um, that Dr. Kurt Duschel brought to the University of Kentucky. You both have honored him tremendously well, and you're carrying the torch. And as his current name Holder, I hope to, I intend to continue carrying that torch and passing it on. So thank you both. Uh, we've greatly enjoyed your, your insight and history today. Thank you very, very much.